everyone. I hope you are doing well. This is going to be another Halloween series video. Um, this is the second time I'm doing it because I forgot to put my phone on Do Not Disturb. Lovely. This story is actually fucking long. I'm going to FYI, you guys. And I'm going to try really hard not to talk this time because the last video I was almost done. And I was at like 17 minutes. And then my phone rang. So, let's get into it. This one is called Timeline of Murder Behind the Gates of Greenwich. Okay. I'm not going to tell you guys anything that I already fucking know. It's pretty fucked up, though. All right, let's get into it. October 30th, 1975. Martha Moxley, 15. Oh, I forgot that she was 15. That just makes this shit even worse because now I know a bunch of shit and you guys don't know. But she's 15. My son's 16. So, I don't... Uh, not going to tell you guys. Martha Moxley, 15, had spent the night out with friends. Then before heading home for the night, she stopped by the Sackle home to chat with the Sackle brothers. Yeah, fuck them already. Just FYI, just fuck them. October 31st, 1975. Martha's body would be found by her friend Sheila the next morning, only 50 yards from her home. She had been bludgeoned and stabbed with a golf club. The head of the club was lying next to her family's driveway. The rest of the club would never be found. Her attacker had pulled her pants and underwear down past her knees, but an examination showed no signs of rape or sexual assault. Pay attention to that shit right there, okay, guys? Because I think I forgot about that, and that's going to come up later. Based on liver temperature, she died between 9.45 and 10 p.m. the previous night. I did not know they used liver temperature, but I said that in the last video, too. But it's 1975. They have better ways now. <laughs> Later, it would be determined that the Sackle family owned the golf club used by the killer. Mm -hmm. The clubs had been tossed throughout their yard and could have been picked up by anyone. Police would question both Michael and his older brother Thomas on October 31st, the day her body was discovered beaten. Michael said that he and Thomas had both seen Martha the night before. Thomas, it was discovered by his timeline, was the last to see Martha before she died. The older Sackle brother told police that he and Michael, along with two friends, had sat in a car with Martha in their driveway from 9 to 9.30 p.m. Their older brothers then made them leave because they needed to give their cousin a ride home. Thomas said that the two friends and Michael left, and he spoke with Martha for a few minutes before she left, too. He then went inside to work on a school report about Abraham Lincoln. When investigators followed up with his teachers, none of them had assigned him such a report. Michael corroborated the first part of his brother's story. He had been in the car with the others, but he had left with his brothers John and Rush Jr. to give his cousin a ride home. So he wasn't sure when Martha had left. Then there was the tutor. Kenneth Littleton, 24, had just moved into the Sackle house the day Martha had died. His alibi was that he was inside watching the French Connection and that the housekeeper, Miss Watson, could collaborate this story. Littleton claimed that at 9.45 p.m., Miss Watson came to him saying she had heard noises outside her window and wanted him to go check it out. Before going to look, he went to check on the Sackle brothers. None of the four were at home. He then went outside but didn't hear or see anyone. He went back inside and continued to watch TV. Thomas was the first brother to return home at 10.25 p.m. He joined Littleton in watching TV. So, this is 75. I was born in 83. Okay. And I'm pretty sure that certain stations just stopped airing at a certain time. So, was there actually something on TV, like... I didn't even think about that before. Was it like midnight they stopped airing? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Are some of you old enough to even know what I'm talking about? They didn't have TV all the fucking time. Like, you couldn't just go at 2 o'clock in the morning and watch TV. There would be nothing. There would be, like, snow, the snow channel. So, comment down below if you guys know what I'm talking about. Anyways, back to the story. He joined Littleton in watching TV. The other three, Rush Jr., John, and Michael, returned about a half hour later. Thomas seemed to have the most unaccountable 
unaccounted for his time by himself and was the focus of the police investigation. They gave him a polygraph test soon after the murder, and it was inconclusive. Mm -hmm. They scheduled another one, and he passed it. Mm -hmm. The police continued going back to the Sackle family, having them go over their timelines repeatedly. After months of this, the family finally had enough. Their attorney suggested they stop talking to the police. You know attorneys do that shit. Oh my god, I have like glitter on my nose. I didn't even notice that shit. Okay, I think I got the glitter off my nose. I did. That's funny. So this whole time I've had glitter on my nose. <laughs> Anyways, back to the story. July 1976. Kenneth Littleton had been let go of by the sick Sackle family and was then living in Nantucket, Massachusetts. It was there that he was arrested for burglary and theft. While they had him in custody, Kenneth was questioned about the murder of Martha Moxley and took a polygraph test, which he failed. Police believed either Littleton or Thomas Sackle was their most likely suspects, but they never had enough to charge either, so the case went cold. 1978. Michael Sackle was arrested for drunk driving. In an attempt to avoid jail time, he made a deal to enroll at the Alan School in Poland Spring, Maine, to get treatment for his alcohol addiction. Mm-hmm. This shit's going to come up later. You guys are going to understand why this is popping up already. In 1991, a lot of fucking years later, forensic pathologist Dr. Henry Lee is brought in and tasked with re-examining the evidence in the Moxley murder. At the time of the murder, investigators had collected clothes they found in the Sacco garage. They believed pants and shoes belonged to Michael that had blonde hair sought to be Martha's. The pants also contained, their, contained hair strands that belonged to a male Caucasian that they could never place. The hairs they thought appeared to be Martha's turned out not to be a match. Dr. Lee reviewed the photographs and determined that the killing was sexually motivated because of the blood smears on her body. He believed that she knew her attacker because there was no defense wounds and that the killer was enraged with her. The other opinion is the killer snuck up behind her in the dark and hit her over the head. After the initial blow, she would have been unconscious or at least dazed while he continued beating and stabbing her. After this, Rushton Sackle, the boy's father, hired a private investigator to look into the case. He believed his sons were innocent and wanted to clear their names. Yeah, he can fuck off too. Mm -hmm. During this process, when the boys met with the investigator, Thomas and Michael changed their stories from 16 years before in 1975. Talking with the police, oh, talking with the private investigator, Thomas opened up and said he lied to the police. He had gone into the house around 9.30 p.m., as he said before, but then he went back outside and talked with Martha some more. And during the second time he spoke with her, they had engaged in a consensual sexual act. He claimed that he had gone inside for the night around 9.50 p.m. He was also very quick, and I laughed about that in the last one. That's probably what took so long. As I was sitting there laughing. So I'm like, oh, he went in about 9.50. And that should happen at like 9.30. But you know, like, whatever. I giggled so hard about that. So anyways, Thomas said he lied to the police because he was scared of how it would look. The problem with this story is that around 1 a.m. that night, Martha's mother, Dorothy, called the Sacco house looking for her daughter. And Thomas said he last saw Martha at 9.30. Why would he lie if he didn't know she was dead yet? Michael also changed his story when he sat down and spoke with the investigator. He still said he had seen Martha in the car and then left with his brothers to give his cousin a ride home. But then around midnight, he went back outside. He walked over to Martha's house and climbed up a tree outside her bedroom. He threw rocks at her window in an attempt to wake her up but she never came to the window, so he went back home. Some claim that if this was true, he should have seen her body in the yard. It wasn't close to her house, it was closer to the road. So depending on the way he walked to her home, he could have missed it. 
Michael does admit that he thought he heard something or someone that night while out, but that he didn't see anyone. So, we're getting into this long-ass timeline of shit, and I remember this from before. This is where it's going to really start cracking on some shit, but it's a timeline. 1994. Michael Sackle worked on Senator Edward Kennedy's re-election campaign as an aide. Pay attention to that shit, because that's going to come out later. On Senator Edward Kennedy's re-election campaign as an aide. Pay attention to that. 1996. A supposed witness contacts a news station with information. While Michael was at the Land School, a roommate claims that he had heard Michael confess to the whole crime. He claims Michael told him that he beat Martha with a golf club because she rejected him, adding, I'm going to get away with murder. I'm a Kennedy. After the first witness's story made the news, a few other people from the Land School came out saying that they had heard the same thing. They claimed that they had asked him if he had killed Martha and he never denied it. 1998. Two true crime books, Green Town by Timothy Dumas and Murder in Greenwich by Mark Furman, are released. June 1998. Superior Court Judge George starts an 18 month one person grand jury review of information gathered by investigators. January 19, 2000. An arrest warrant for unnamed individuals was issued for Martha Moxley's murder. Later that day, Michael Sackle surrenders to police and is released on a $500,000 bond. It just gets worse, guys. June 21st, 2000. At the pretrial hearing, two former classmates of Sackle's from the land school testified that he confessed to them back in the 70s. They gave testimony that Michael said, I'm going to get away with murder. I'm a Kennedy. You're not a Kennedy. You were. What did I say he was? An aide. You were an aide of the Kennedy. Okay? And it wasn't even the Kennedy. It was some kind of Kennedy. He was probably a cousin or something. I don't remember ever hearing that name before. But anyways. May 7, 2002. Testimony begins in the murder trial of Martha Moxley 27 years after her death. June 7, 2002. Sackle is convicted. August 29, 2002. Michael Sackle was con sentenced to 20 years in life in prison oh 20 years to life in prison i'm just i already fucking know what's gonna happen at this point i got almost to the fucking end and then my phone rang fucked everything up so anyways november 24 2003 sackle's lawyers file an appeal trying to overturn the murder conviction january 13 2006 see here my son was born the Connecticut Supreme Court upholds the murder conviction. November 13, 2006. The U.S. Supreme Court declines to hear Sackle's appeal making the conviction stand. April 17, 2007. His, attorney, his attorneys file Sackle's petition for a new trial. Former high school classmate Gitano Tony Bryant says two of his friends were involved in the murder in Sackle. October 25, 2007. The petition for a new trial is denied because the judge doesn't find any statements by Bryant credible. The judge said African Americans couldn't have gone unnoticed in that neighborhood. I mean, I know this was 1975 that this shit actually happened. But who's not going to go unnoticed in that neighborhood? White man. I'm just saying. Fucking bullshit. Such a racist ass comment. I hate that I had to fucking read that shit again. I didn't even want to read it the first time, but here I am reading it again because fucking goddamn telemarketers. Anyways, let's get back to it. November 6, 2007. Sackle's legal team filed a right of habeas corpus and petitioned for a new trial in federal court. September 27, 2010. Sackle's lawyers filed a new appeal claiming that his trial attorney, Mickey Sherman, was incompetent. Sherman had failed to obtain evidence from prosecuting attorneys pointing to other suspects. Also, Sherman's financial problems drew his focus away from the case. Sherman had pleaded guilty in June for failing to pay $400,000 in federal income taxes. 
February 8th, 2011. Michael Sackle tries for the fourth time to overturn his conviction, testifies at his appeal hearing. March 6, 2012. The Connecticut Supreme Court denied Sackle's last appeal. October 24, 2012. The State Parole Board denied Sackle parole. October 23, 2013. Because his defense attorney, Mickey Sherman, was considered constitutionally deficient, a Connecticut appellate judge orders a new trial to be set for Sackle. This is where I got last time. I was this far, except for I was further in time, but whatever. November 21, 2013. Sackle was released on bond with several conditions set by Superior Court Judge Gary White. Sackle could not leave Connecticut. He must wear a GPS tracking device and has to report to a bail commissioner. August 8, 2014. Prosecutors file an, app, an appeal to reinstate Sackle's conviction. December 30, 2016. Connecticut Supreme Court reinstates Sackle's guilty conviction from 2002 in a 4-3 decision, which would reverse the appellate court's order of a new trial. Okay. January 6, 2017. Oh, that's my birthday. January 6. Sackle's attorneys file a motion asking for a seven-member court panel to hear their motion to reconsider the Connecticut Supreme Court ruling. I mean, it's my birthday, dude. You guys can just fuck off me doing shit on my birthday. We're partying. <laughs> May 4th, 2018. The Connecticut Supreme Court vacates Sackle's conviction, which left the prosecutors the option to retry Sackle in the future. That's bullshit. August 8, 2018. Connecticut files a petition with the U.S. Supreme Court to have Connecticut's vacated conviction undone based on ineffective assistance of counsel. I don't understand what any of this shit means, guys. I'm just reading it. I don't even know what the fuck's going on. Did they? I, I don't know. I have no idea what's going on. I hope you guys do because I have no, I have not a clue. January 7th, 2019. U.S. Supreme Court denies Connecticut's petition. The conviction is considered vacated without any further options except for the state to retry him. Ending thoughts. Groups of people believe Michael Sackle killed Martha and is now free. Oh, he's free. Okay. Without any recourse. Others believe he has served his time, but there is a large group of supporters who believe Michael was not the most likely suspect and that the state and prosecution's office never even looked at the other more likely suspects in the case. What do you guys think? I mean, he didn't think he was going to jail at all because he was a Kennedy. But, you know. Did he serve enough time? Was he the one that actually did it? I mean, there was that other guy, that little John guy or whatever. I mean, it could have been him too. I mean, it's kind of ironic that he moved in the day that she fucking died or whatever, you know. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of shit. There's a lot of factors to the story. I would love to hear what you guys have to say down in the comments. <clears throat> if you guys like this video, please give me a thumbs up. If you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe. And on that note, you guys have a great day and thanks for watching.